Okay. Started the recording. Cool. Can you hear me still? Okay. There's a VPN involved, and in the last time I did so many machines, and <clears throat> it didn't work out so great. <laughs> Okay, so let me start off by um, showing the results, like what you get from this. Kind of dangle the carrot, and then I'll show you how to get to the carrot. How's that sound? <laughs> Let's see. Can I share this screen? Let's see here. Is that coming out? Yep. See Google. Yeah. Okay. So local hosts. I think I've got a container on this machine. Hopefully it's still working. <clears throat> okay, good. So there's the and this is on a Windows machine, but I'm only sharing just this Chrome window so that it's nice and big on your screen in the meeting. This is uh the evergreen um splash page that we're all familiar with that we all love and adore, right? Um, and so let me see if I'll share a different screen and go over to this one. This is, um, on the same computer. Everybody see that? This is the, um, evergreen source. Code? Small on my screen. Is there? Can you zoom in a little or enlarge it, enlarge it a little? Yeah. Let me see. Does that do anything for you? Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, great. Okay. Just changing the size of the window. Okay. Uh, so this is a uh, home search .tt2. I just figured we'd edit. We would edit a um, a temp a template. And real quick, I can just do you know h1 hello slash h1. I can barely see it. Okay, there. And then I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to share the other screen back again. And everybody see that? And then I'm going to um, refresh. And there it is. Um, so it's uh, it's a Docker container running in a Windows box where you've got your source code on your C drive, on your Windows hard drive. And when you press save on anything in the template toolkit, the Angular, the Angular JS, or even the Perl stuff, um, it will immediately take effect or close to right here on localhost. That's what we're trying to get to so far. I feel like I'm talking to a blank audience. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> okay. Um, so to get here, uh, you have to install Docker on your Windows box. You have to install, um, you have to have the evergreen uh, source code on your Windows box. Um, Chrome is nice because that's one of the major supported browsers. Um, let's see. Let me show one more thing that you can do, and that is to rebuild. Let's see if I can share my other. Share another window. Share file explorer. Okay, everybody see that? I guess I could have sh just shared um, Visual Studio Code, but this is the directory that's in that's hooked up to the Docker container, and there are some uh, files in here, like this one. That will rebuild the Angular um, stuff. So if you have a file in the root called eg rebuild Angular, like that, the container reads that, sees it, see it just disappeared automatically. And then because I put that file in there with that exact name, it triggers the container to rebuild Angular, all the Angular um, stuff stuff well, a step that you would normally have to do when you're you know changing the code changing that part of the evergreen code and then if you look at the contents well you can't see it let me switch windows again I'm trying to make it so you can see everything because i got the resolution jacked up so high i just do one window at a time 
So here's VS Code, the exact same folder, and then here's the rebuild screen output. And you can see what um, the Docker container is doing internally. So it just outputs to a file on the root of your um, repository here. So you can see that it's being built and the output of being uh, of the uh, MP build process. Does this look familiar to anybody? I don't know if you can see the little thumbs up going across your screen, Blake. Okay, okay. So, so what? The, I didn't really lay out the premise. So, you know, when you're editing Angular files, you have to recompile your code, and that was one of the problems I was having with this Docker container. Was like, how do you, you know, what's the mechanism to teach the Docker container when to do that? There is a watch command, but that proved to be pretty slow and annoying. Um, when you're editing code like crazy and pressing save. Hey, look, it's giving you more feedback. So it's probably done at this point, rebuilding it. And once that's done, then you know you can refresh the web browser and you'll see your result, the uh, code changes that you made. So let me switch over to a different um, machine. So here I've got, let me see, am I in this one? Here we are. Um, here's a fresh computer, uh, an empty Windows computer, just a regular desktop. Is this super tiny? Yeah, it's really tiny. Yeah, that sounds great. Right but let, I was just going to show that what you need to do is you need to Google like Docker desktop. And can anybody see that okay? Or should I switch? Let's see. <laughs> All right, is that better? It's still really small. Yeah, okay, nice. but it's better than before. That's okay. Great. Okay, so that's Google results for Docker Desktop. It goes to Docker.com, and if you click on, basically, this is the page that we're trying to get to, and you can download this um, Docker Desktop for Windows. It's a 655 megabyte download today, and so I've already done that, and I've got, and I'll uh, run through the wizard for you here. Switch Windows. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and launch the installer, and then I'll share that screen. Trying to make this go fast. Okay. Okay, how's that look? Looks good. That's good. So this is the first step of when I double click on the installer. Okay, and press OK. And it does that for a while. <laughs> and then you got to reboot. Okay. Okay. And then let me switch back to. In so I also like to install on Windows. I like to install Git um, Bash. Makes it feel a little bit like Linux. Let's do this one. So I'm going to type in Google uh, Git Bash. Git for Windows looks like this. This is a little icon. That's how I know I'm in the right place. It's got this like four color diamond thing, this thing. So I'm going to download that. That's a pretty small little download. And I'll run through the installer of that. Now, th the reason I think this is important to share is because there's a step during this setup that I, especially when you're fooling around with the Evergreen repository, it's important to set a setting this way. I'll show you. Whenever that launcher starts, Inception. OK, so here's the other. Here's the installer for Git Bash. Looks like that. Is that coming through? Uh, I'm not really seeing anything right now. No. Let's try again.
Mm, it's running as administrator. Dang it. It doesn't won't share that window. Maybe if I press next. Nothing, right? Okay. All right, well, I'll just do the whole window. We'll just have to fight through it, or the whole screen, I mean. Can everybody see this super tiny window over here? I'm wiggling. Yeah, that's showing up. <laughs> okay. All right, this is the Git Bash install. I'm going to run through it real quick. There's a spot in here that you have to watch. Um, this stuff's all good. Default, 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 default. Right here. Can everybody see this? When you're installing Git Bash for Windows, there's this nonsense where it wants to check out Windows style and commit Linux line ending. It changes the line endings basically. And so you don't want that. And but for some reason it defaults to that. So we're gonna we're gonna change this to as is, commit as is. Um, that setting right there has bitten me so many times. It'll change the line endings, and you know almost all of the files in the Evergreen Git repository is Linux Unix line endings, not Windows line endings. So anyway, make sure you change that to that when you install Git Bash for Windows. Otherwise, everything else is pretty good on the defaults all the way through. Okay, so that's um, that's pretty much it. We could uh, we could go ahead and go over. Let me share the other window here. Share Chrome back again. Chrome, Chrome, Chrome. Uh, is that that working? Um, the other thing is um, get Hub Desktop. This is a nice little tool. This guy right here. Download for Windows. Everybody, follow me on that. Yeah. All right. So that that thing is pretty easy to install. I just wanted to show that. So I, I like to have that tool installed also kind of in conjunction to the git bash. So you got the command line and you got a GUI. Kind of use each one for their own purposes, different purposes. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing on this computer. I'm going to hop over to a different computer. And this one, I was struggling to get docker and uh, so i'm going to skip over to the final one again or actually what do i want to do here i'm going to share this one Here we are. Here's um, Notepad++. Let's see here. Everybody see that? There's a, uh, okay, great. And actually, let me, let me show off Docker Hub. So as, if anybody's not familiar, Docker Hub, Docker Hub is a place, you know, like it says there, a container library. It's a place where anybody can host um, Docker images. Um, Evergreen dash ILS, I think. There it is. So this is where we're putting our containers out there on the internet for anybody to download. Everybody see that okay? Let me blow it up a little bit. Is that, is that better? Good. Yeah. All right. Um, so recently I've updated this readme so that it's a little more intuitive, I think, now that we're not just hosting regular evergreen um, Docker images, but also this dev image. So this top piece up here is all about how to to use the regular um, Evergreen container that's not really outfitted for development, where you just run the Evergreen server, 
test server real quick. And here's the command for that. Uh, Docker run, map all the ports, and then there's the image at the end, Mobius Office Evergreen ILS. That's the name of the image. And if you don't do a colon on the end of the image, it'll just choose the latest. And to illustrate what I'm talking about, over here in the tags tab, there are all of the Docker images that we've posted. So latest is 3.10.0. We don't have 3.10.1 up here, up there yet, but 3.10.0 is synonymous with latest. There's the dev image right there. And then going back down through here, we've got a 391 image. We got um, 381, 390, 371, 362, 353. We, we've been at this a long time. So this goes all the way back to 212. Um, <laughs> I kind of wonder if the 212 image even works today. But uh, if you ever were curious about setting up quickly a particular version of Evergreen, this is a pretty quick way to do that. You can just um, issue the Docker command that I was showing off over here under overview. I'll go down to it again right here. The exact same command, but then at the end, after Evergreen-ILS, you put a colon, and then you reference the tag, the image tag. If you want to get um, a 390, you would say colon 3.9.0. And even, oh, here it even gives you the. So let me copy that. Oh, but I'm I'm only showing this one screen. I was going to paste it in Notepad. Um. So you get the idea. So you can reference this website to so, sort of inform you as to what tags are available for what image. But we're going to be talking about the dev image. I just updated six days ago. So we're going to go over the overview, and I wanted to talk. There's a little section down here about the dev container for hacking Evergreen. Um, it's still similar where you map your port 80 to and 443 and all the different ports into the container. And here is a Postgres port you can map into it so you can talk to the Postgres server. Um, and then there's this new thing here, dash V, and then you give it a local path on your local machine to where you have where you have evergreen cloned and then colon and then the path inside of the container where you want it to be mounted that's not going to change it's always home open surf repos evergreen but this part right here needs to be replaced with your local path if you're on linux it'd be slash like just like that if you're on windows um, you do something kind of funky here, slash, slash, C, slash, user, slash, Blake, slash, document, wherever you've got the uh, Evergreen repository cloned on Windows, this should get replaced. But just remember that it's slash, slash, C at the front, slash, and then wherever you've got it. All righty. And then here at the end, I think I did colon dev to show that. And then there's some blurb in here about uh, what it does, how it works. And then here's the paths. So repos, evergreen, open ILS, web, JS, UI, default staff is actually uh, linked to the live, you know, open ILS var, web, JS, UI, default staff. Same for DG2. And then the Perl mods are also linked up in there. So you can edit the Perl mods and it'll be in the container. And then there's the bootstrap depths. Then there's also the t template toolkit regular uh, old OPAC and also the bootstrap template mapped over. That's how that worked um, immediately. And then there's a blurb in here about restarting the Evergreen services. If you want to fully, and I didn't show that off earlier, but if you want to restart Evergreen, that is all of OpenSurf and Evergreen and Apache and Nginx and all that stuff, you put a file in the root of your evergreen repository called eg restart go and that will kick off a restart of the container um, evergreen services and i already i did show this off rebuilding the evergreen angular you put an eg rebuild angular like we showed earlier so there we go now all that said you got to get Docker desktop installed. That's probably going to be the most 
um, difficult. That is, you install it, it seems like it'd work, but it doesn't work right away. There's some extra commands you got to put on the shell, some WSL commands. It tells you what to do, but I've had to fiddle with it a couple of times, like uninstall it, reinstall it, um, which is what I was just doing leading up to this meeting um, on another machine. But um, so then I wanted to maybe show off running it. Um, running this command here and showing what it does. And so let me see if I can share that. And then I think I'll be done. We can have a discussion or questions. Oops, wrong window. Let's go over to this window. There we are. Um, this is Windows PowerShell. And once you have Docker Desktop installed, you can type in Docker commands here, like Docker PS. Can everybody see that? Yep. OK. Um, for those of you not familiar, I just threw a new thing at you. Docker is the command. And then you can pass in different things you want to ask Docker. I typed in PS, meaning. Um, What's running? What what containers are running? Um, on my screen, this is really fuzzy, but I think you can see it. That this is the container that's running now. And if um, I'd like to kill that container off and start a new one, so I'm going to do. Well, I'm going to show you the GUI. There's a there's a way to do this in the GUI in the Docker desktop GUI. Over here, everybody see that? Um, so a second ago, I typed in Docker PS. This is another way to see the same thing using the GUI. It's showing us the um, container that's running on this machine here. It says here that it's running, and it's got six ports mapped to it six days ago. And I'm just going to hit stop on here, stop. And as soon as I do that, it'll it'll die off, and I can show that it doesn't work anymore by showing the web browser. Back to Chrome again. Here's the local host. Everybody see that? Um, if I refresh this now that I've killed the container, just to drive the point home, this shouldn't work. Yeah, OK. It's dead. So I'm going to start a new um, container using that command from a minute ago. And I'll copy and paste the command right in there from I think I think my path is actually exactly right. Users GitHub Evergreen, I think so. Let's just try it. Did everybody see that command there? It's getting caught off a little bit at the bottom though. Yeah, I saw that. Is that helping? Yeah. At all? Yep, that was uh, that was good. <clears throat> okay, cool. Thanks. So that's the whole thing, and I just copied and pasted that straight off the website. Now you'll have to probably edit this a little bit to match your. I'm gonna move my cursor over right in this area right here where it mentions the local path. I'm on Windows so slash slash C slash Windows slash like slash blah blah blah. If I press enter. Watch your fingers, live demo. There it goes. So it kicks off this Ansible script, which goes through and basically reinstalls Evergreen. <laughs> it takes, and that's why it takes a while, because it takes the Evergreen repository that you passed in on that command and um, reinstalls Evergreen based on that folder that you passed it. Um, while that's running, I'll show you what the GUI looks like now. This is what Docker Desktop shows now that I've kicked off another one. So as you might imagine, it, you know, there's this grayed out one, the one that we stopped, exited, and then there's this new one now. And it gets these random names, you know, 
these clever, funny names. <laughs> if I click on the one that's green, um, you get a little UI, and it shows you the log, which log means the console. Like If you think of it in terms of like a VM running, it's what's on TTY0. It's on the first shell, I suppose. So that's sitting there going through the motions of, you know, messing with the D and setting it back up again and reinstalling and then it's setting up OpenSurf and installing Evergreen from the repository. This can take a while um, because it has to completely reinstall Evergreen. It kind of goes through quite a bit of stuff here. And then when it's done, it'll have that play thing. And let me show up one more little bit here, which is over here, back on the PowerShell window. When this is done, it'll show that Ansible playbook thing. And you don't want to press Control-C. I know I've mentioned it in that email, and it's also kind of mentioned on the readme there on, on hub.docker.com. But if you, instead of holding Control-C, which will kill the container, and then you'll have to start all over again, if you hold Control and press PQ, it'll drop you out of the uh, Docker console, and you're back to the shell again. Uh, now, if you do Docker PS, you should see that it's still there running in the background. And if you go and look at the Docker desktop UI, it'll still report that it's sitting here running. And that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I kind of glazed over VS Code. I mean, you can have that installed as your IDE to edit the Evergreen repository. I've also didn't really get into Git very much, but there's, you know, you're going to branch, you know, change branches and stuff like that. But um, any questions? Maybe we can cover some questions in the video. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so I also originally on my other computer did the virtual machine that um, Bill offered with the Ansible script. And because it was a virtual machine, I just pretty much like kept it in that safe state. Um, it, is it this one of those things where you do have to like kill it or you could just like keep it up? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you don't have to like restart it when you're done using it. Yeah, right, where you can like save it exactly where it is. Yeah. Um, that's a feature of full-blown virtual machines. Um, and so Docker containers are built or originally designed by the Docker people that invented the whole the whole thing. The idea was you were going to just set a Docker machine to go and do something, like one little thing, and then it would die. So Docker is, by design, supposed to be temporary. <laughs> Uh, they expect you to design a container to launch, execute something, and then die uh, real quick. It turns on really fast and turns off really fast. We're sort of abusing it here by installing a full-blown evergreen server. Um, but no, the answer is, in short, no, it doesn't have the feature of freezing and then you, where you can re like restart your computer and then unfreezing it is right where you were. You just have to start the container again now you can start old containers i didn't go over that instead of launching a new one let me go illustrate the point there's two containers here instead of starting a new one i could have just pressed play on the old one the one that we stopped and it would crank back up and it would kick in the it would restart all of the, all of that stuff that we were just seeing the ansible stuff so it's not any faster unfortunately the way that this is designed, it has to reinstall Evergreen on boot, so to speak. Um, so I just start. I made a new container. I guess the only drawback is disk space. You're going to soak up some more disk by launching another one as opposed to starting the old one. But I think it's just fine to start an old one up that you previously stopped. All right, cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, any other questions?
I have a feeling that I'm going to have a million questions once I actually have time to try to try to do <laughs> what I have to do right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's, but, that it's the Docker desktop that's probably the most tricky because it, it installs Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And so if you don't already have that installed, you know, kicking that off and there's a whole layer in there. So Docker desktop relies on that working first. It kind of glazes over it when you're installing the Docker desktop uh, wizard, but um, whenever you reboot your computer after having installed Docker desktop and then it, you launch it for the first time, it's going to, just a minute ago, I was messing with this and it was complaining and WSL wasn't set up or it wasn't, wasn't on version two, it required version two. So you had to issue a command. Once you get, once you get <laughs> through all that, uh, once you get that set up just right, it'll look just like what I've been showing off and you can, um, you know, edit evergreen kind of live on your workstation. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Blake. This is you're, really cool. You're welcome. No problem. And yeah, let's give me my little, if you can see the claps rolling by your screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I am going to turn it over next to Stephanie, who has an update on the accessibility guide. Yes, just very briefly, I've been adding to it. Um, I'm hoping to have a draft done in time for the conference next week. But right now, the only big new section is ARIA. Um, <laughs> you may have seen Jane and I going back and forth in some of the bug comments about some fine points <laughs> of ARIA descriptions. We're learning as we go. Um, I read a bunch of stuff specifically about ARIA, found kind of a mixed bag of information about it. It's very confusing. There is an awareness among the like web accessibility initiative people and, and WCAG and all those folks that ARIA is difficult right now um, and that it needs to be easier. But this is what we have for now. So there's about like eight or 10 pages in the guide devoted to this now. It's a big section. Oh my. Um, <laughs> so if you haven't, if you've been wondering like what the hell is ARIA, hopefully this demystifies that and if you don't feel like you can tackle this that's okay aria is one of the more complicated parts of accessibility stuff um i just wanted to throw that out there in case anybody wants some light reading for the weekend <laughs> how, how many pages are we up to now uh, <laughs> over 30. um <laughs> yeah it's and and there's still like three or four big to do sections to go so <laughs> well, enjoy we, we all really appreciate you doing this <laughs> no problem <laughs> and come to my workshop where you get to hear me do this for three there. hours yeah <laughs> great and um that was all we had on our agenda today and does anybody else have anything that you want to talk about i'm going to go ahead and hit stop on the recorder